Veterans Day is November 11th of every year, including this year, 2015. And strange as it may seem, there are two songs that popped into my head. One is, you gotta be a football hero. And the other one is the Bee Gees song that some of you may remember. Tragedy, when the feeling's gone and you can't go on, it's tragedy. Well, on today's show, we're going to be talking about heroes and tragedies. And, you know, there's something about our language that on certain occasions uh, is woefully inadequate. And that is that the word tragedy and hero are two of the most overused words in our language. Well, as you'll see in a few minutes, we're going to be talking about a remarkable hero, even by the standards of heroism, a remarkable hero. And we're going to be talking about a genuine tragedy that befell him and others in 1945, 70 years ago. I'm Bruce Apar, and you're watching Hudson Valley WXYZ with Bruce the Blog. Hudson Valley WXYZ with Bruce the Blog is a weekly program where we bring you unique people in our community making contributions to our quality of life and we also like to explore ideas and, and issues and topics that are of interest and affect all of us and we thank Chase Media Group and its CEO Carla Chase and its Chief Strategy Officer Frank J. Rich for producing the show, which you also can see by going on YouTube and searching for Hudson Valley WXYZ or searching for Bruce the Blog. And so Veterans Day is November 11th, uh, and we always like to pay homage to it, which it certainly deserves, to say the least. And, and my guest, uh, David Rocco. David, welcome. Hey, Bruce, nice to see you. David again. Rocco, uh, who happens to live in, in Yorktown, uh, gets around way beyond Yorktown and does a tremendous amount of uh, volunteer work, uh, a lot of it to honor uh, people of the past who are true heroes and may have been, I know as, as you like to put it, David, you know, may have been forgotten or never known by a lot of people. Sure. Um, and, and that certainly fits your, your most recent project, which is called Friends of the Mount, Mount Beacon, Beacon six. 6, or now you've updated uh, it. Or Mount Beacon 8. Friends of the Mount Beacon 8. Um, so why don't we talk about uh, you know, what that's about, because I know on November 14th, just three days after Veterans Day, you have a, a ceremony coming up right. um, uh, uh, to uh, honor the, the eight people that are in the title of your, uh, of your organization, right? It, um, two plane crashes on Mount Beacon. Uh, let me just back up a little bit. I was involved in the restoration project of the Mount Beacon Fire Tower. And towards the end of the uh, restoration work, we had a grand celebration back in June of 2013. Somebody had mentioned to me about the uh, plane crash uh, several years ago. So I dug into it and I found out there was a plane crash November 11, 1945. Right. And six Navy flyers were killed there. During that time, after doing research there, it was brought to my attention there was also a Navy plane crash on September 14, 1935. So it originally went from Friends in the Mount Beacon 6 to now Friends in the Mount Beacon 8. Right. And, and it's known, um, obviously, in, in, in quite a uh, dubious way as the aerial graveyard, right? Or that, that, that spot. That section, that section yeah. of Mount Beacon is actually in the town of Fishkill. It's like right. um, near Route 84, Route 52 in that area. Right. So a lot of people get confused thinking that's in the city of Beacon. Right, but it's actually in Fishkill, on the, right. you know, basically on the Hudson, by the Hudson River. You know? Right. And, and, and there's this, uh, this person, and I was referring to him uh, in particular uh, in the opening segment, um, 
Commander uh, Dixie Kiefer, right? Right. Dixie Kiefer was, I mean, when I discovered this, he was a larger-than-life legend. Right. I mean, somebody wrote in one of the articles I came across, he didn't look like your prototypical hero, the six foot four guy. Right. This guy was 5'10 and maybe 240. Right. And he balled in and with a limp. But basically, there were photographs I have when he fell off one of the ships and one of the kamikaze attacks that he uh, was under like three times. Right. Men surrounded him like he was like, they loved him like a father figure. Right. And he, he was adored by so many people. And one of the most incredible things that I came across during this whole process, there was quite a few of them, was that I was reaching out to uh, different media outlets. And one of my contacts from my previous projects was from AP, based out of Albany. So I told, him, yeah. I told him about what we were doing. So he wrote back to me, because you're not going to believe this, my father was a, uh, a pilot for Dixie Keeper on the USS Yorktown. Well, wow. and, and we, should, we should point out to people, uh, because I'm also a, a Yorktowner, uh, that the USS Yorktown doesn't refer to the town of Yorktown in uh, New York, uh, no. in Westchester County, of course. Um, yeah, it was the Yorktown uh, in Virginia. In Virginia, right. right. Uh, you know, I mean, the Yorktown here is, has uh, historical significance, but the one in Virginia, of course, uh, uh, we, we learn about in history, right, in school. Uh, Later on. I mean, uh, uh, Dixie Keeper's history, I mean, I came across this with the purpose of trying to bring uh, light to the other five people that were killed on that plane crash right. in 45. Um, but it's really hard to ignore a 30-year 30 30 career of Dixie Keeper because he was the first person to ever fly a plane at night off a ship off the coast of San Diego in 1924. Right. So it's just one thing after another, this career that just kept getting bigger and bigger. I yeah. Mean, and, and I had never uh, heard about him. I mean, and when I read about it, uh, you know, there was this uh, very, very well-written article uh, that you had sent uh, from the Poughkeepsie Journal. John uh, Farrow. Written by John Farrow. I want to... You know, being a journalist myself, I definitely want to give him kudos and high praise because it's a very well-written piece. And, I, and actually, I want to read part of it because just to hear what this man did is, is beyond comprehension. I mean, literally beyond comprehension because that's why I said, you know, we watch football games and, or any kind of sport and we say hero. This is what a hero is. Absolutely. I mean, when you, when you hear what he did, um, it, it's superhuman. I mean, that, right? I would say it's superhuman what he did. It's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to, um, and the print is very small. I don't want people to think I'm that old, but <laughs> the print is very small on, the, on how it printed out, so I'm going to be using this little magnifying thing. So on, on January 21st, 1945, the Ticonderoga, commanded by Kiefer, was attacked by five kamikaze pilots during an operation near Formosa, now Taiwan. Two of the planes reached their target, the Ticonderoga. Right? Right. The first plane and its bomb crashed into the carrier's flight deck, exploding in a ball of fire. Kiefer turned the ship so the wind would not fan the flames and flooded compartments on one side to induce a 10-degree list that... Uh, dumped burning fuel overboard. I mean, the presence of mind. I mean, I understand he's trained to do it, but in the heat of battle, I mean, this is somebody who... Waste under pressure. To say he kept his wits about him is an understatement. Um, the second plane, this is now the kamikaze plane, planes, the second plane hit on the starboard side near the command island. Shrapnel flew into the bridge, ripping through Kiefer's body and shattering one arm. Through it all, Kiefer remained in command on the bridge for 12 hours. This is what I'm talking about. This, this man was superhuman. During the Battle of Midway, Kiefer, serving as the Yorktown's executive officer, survived the carrier's sinking on June 7, 1942. His hands were severely burned as he lowered an injured man to a life raft. The pain in his hands was so great that when he tried lowering himself down a line, he could not support his own weight. Kiefer fell, striking the ship's armor belt on the way down, and suffered a compound fracture of his foot and ankle. It just gets more and more unbelievable. In spite of the pain, he swam alongside a life raft and pushed it toward a rescuing destroyer before becoming so exhausted he had to be pulled 
from the water. <laughs> and it goes on to say, it's no wonder then that Secretary Forrestal, who was born and raised in Beacon, by the way, um, has given Kiefer, or had given Kiefer, the title of the indestructible man, right? Now, at the end of the article, I also just want to finish with this. I mean, so not only was this man just extraordinary, I mean, you just heard what, what, what he did um, when anybody else either would have been dead or, or just, you know, unconscious. I don't, I don't know what. They wouldn't have been doing anything of the things he was doing. But so his heroism was matched by his humility, you know, right. which is just all the more extraordinary. And so when he was still recovering from his wounds suffered on the Ticonderoga, Kiefer deflected the attention his heroics had received. The real heroes, he said, were not basically lifers like him, yeah. right, in the Navy. But this is what he said. The real heroes were the reserves and the Greenhorn sailors. Kiefer, no, Kiefer noting a directive from Forrestal, placed special emphasis on the service of African-American mess workers and stewards. Quote, this is him talking. There is nothing heroic about we, us regulars, he said. We weren't giving up homes, good jobs, and pleasant shores to go to sea. I mean, it, it, I, even as I'm reading it, David, I'm like in awe of this person. He was an extraordinary man. Um, and like I said, always men adored him. Think about the flight that he was on. Uh, this was 1945. Um, one of the passengers, Clarence and this Hooper. Is, and we should, as you're talking, I want to make sure we get to these because there's a few of them. This so is, that's, a, that's the kind of plan, the exact This is the model of the flight. It that was, he was uh, on, the uh, six uh, of Navy them. Navy Transport Beachwood twin engine. Right. It's probably maybe the most who would sit eight, ten people. Um, so this is the model. There were still pieces of the plane left on top of Mount Beacon right now. Uh, and that's how I came across it back last spring. So here we are. I don't know exactly what part of the plane it is, but if you notice here, American flag was put up there by a group five years ago who was honoring them with the 65th anniversary. And in this particular photograph, this is Dixie Keeper himself. Um, like I said, it is not your. Okay, so that's yeah, that's uh, yeah. Now we're looking uh, at D Dixie Keeper. I know Richard, our director, is going to be putting it up so people can see it in close up. Yeah, and so, and he was, when he, uh, when he died in the accident, he was, what, 40? 49. 49, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's not your atypical-looking hero, but he, you know, he, he was like a larger life. Yeah, you know, it's, it's what's inside that counts. It, it, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's def, absolutely. Um, I'm moving too fast, or I'm okay right now? No, no, you're moving at just the right pace. Okay, so this is the commander, the pilot of the plane that crashed in Mount Beacon. This is uh, Lloyd Heinsen. He's okay. from Colorado Springs. Right. Uh, by the way, Dixie Keeper was from Blackfoot, Idaho, but okay. for a 30-year career, he moved all over the place. As a matter of fact, his mother lived with him. He was single in Quonset Point, Rhode Island, which was the last place he was a commander. Uh, Quonset Point, uh, Rhode Island. Yeah. Dixie Kiefer. Right, so... Um, and this and this gentleman, uh, is Lloyd, Lloyd Heinsen, Heinsen, was 23 years old at the time, right? Yeah, yeah, Lloyd was the pilot of the plane that crashed. Unfortunately, it was just terrible weather that day. But he had an extraordinary career in the South Pacific. Um, shot down six Japanese planes. He in hmm. himself was shot down but survived. So it's just another incredible, you know, yep, hero right that yep. was not used to. Now, back in June, we... Based on that article, we had a hike up to the crash site, and 45 people showed up that day. And, and, and how, how did you uh, let them know about it? How did they find out about the... From the articles like this, um, other media outlets put okay. out stories about it. Um, I was trying to get like um, an awareness uh, opportunity for the ceremony that's going to be held in November. So. It was actually tied in, I have to give them credit for it, I Love New York had a Path Through History weekend. Right. And we signed on as one of the programs, and which was perfect, because Path Through History in you know, New right. York. So exactly. this, yeah. even it, they this also This literally said, is a path <laughs> up the mountain through history, right? It, so the day we get there, we have 45 people in the parking lot there. I'm doing my little spiel about all the history as much as I possibly can. And then we start to walk up. I can't walk too fast, fast because I have two bad knees. Yeah. So this gentleman joins us in the walk. His name is George Atkinson. He's a, from Beacon, New York. Okay. So we're all looking at each other. How's this guy? We don't know how old he is, but we can just tell he's up there. How we 
going to manage this. So I said, look, I'm not walking fast, so I'll just walk with him. So we start to talk on the, ride, on the walk up. Turns out his brother was one of the people that found the plane crash a day after the plane crashed because the authorities could not find the plane crash site. So his brother was one of the guys that actually found it for the authorities. So he went up there the day after wow. that. So here was a guy who was now 88 years old, walked and he, back up and to the site. And he was, George Attica was up there. 70 years ago. You're saying on November 12th, 1945. Right, or 13th, yeah. which was uh, which maybe you said it Tuesday. Happened, it happened on the 11th, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so a day or two later, he was... It was just an amazing day. He, was, he wanted to get back there, and he's passed the reached out to me after that. He wanted to thank me for having, organizing this hike, because right. it was important to him that he get back there. It was something he could share. In the background, uh, you could barely see it here, but there's a plaque on the tree. Yes, right. That was a copy of the New York Times article from November 12th, 1945. George's brother is quoted in the article. Oh, wow. So and, and, and the flag, you put the flag up there? The American flag? The well, the group, uh, Dr. Bill Stolfi, who was a dentist in Downstate Correctional Facility, organized a hike back five years ago. I had reached out to him. I said, look, I'd like to get you know, memorial service going for the 70th, which, you know, it's also the end of the World War II as well. Right. So he said, oh, sure, let's do it together. And, and we've been working on this together. He's the one that put the flag up. So is that there all the time, or was it there just for the hike? Pardon me? Is the flag there? Oh, it's all the time. All the time. All yeah. the time. Okay. All, right. all the time. All but right. there's also six little flags, right, in, right. In, in, um, into the ground next to pieces of the plane wreckage. Right. So that's for each individual. But I was trying to say before, the interesting thing about how remarkable Dixie Kiefer was, one of the six passengers on the, uh, the crash in, Plane, in yeah. 45 was an African-American right. by the name of Clarence Hooper. Mm -hmm. Now, Clarence was a, a mechanic. Right. So he was young as well, 22 or 23. There was a David Wood who was the other passenger. He was also 22, he was a seaman. So these guys were probably blown away that Dixie Keeper would ask them to get yeah. on the flight from their base in Rhode Island to fly down to the Metropolitan New York. They landed in Caldwell, New Jersey. It was at that time called Curtis Wright Airport. Okay. Now, that's the Wrights from the Wright Brothers. Oh, the Wright Brothers, right. right. Well, Curtis was a big engine, aeronautical company, and they got together and they oh. eventually bought out the Wright Brothers. Oh, so it was Curtis hyphen Wright. Oh, I right. see what you're saying. Yeah, well, so it was Orville and Wilbur Wright, and okay. So, um, and what's remarkable about that airport, for a historical point, it's now called Essex County Airport. That's the same airport John Kennedy Jr. flew out of on his way to um, Martha's Vineyard when he was killed. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's, right. it was an easy airport to get from people from New York City. Right. The purpose why the six guys came down from Rhode Island that day is that they wanted to go to a football game at Yankee Stadium. Which they went to. Which they went to. And they were on the way which back. Which was on Saturday the 10th. Right. And that was Army versus Notre Dame. Right. And the four top teams back at that time was Army number one, Notre Dame two, Navy three, mm. and Alabama four. Wow. So you're thinking that this is November 11th, less than a month away, you got that big traditional Army-Navy game. Yes, right. And they're both in the top 10, you know, top five for college football. Right. As a matter of fact, Army went on to be undefeated. They beat Navy on December 1st, 32 to 13. And the star of that team was Doc Blanchard. Doc Blanchard, right. And he received the Heisman Trophy. And, and then, uh, of course, there was Glenn Davis, you know, two, and, two, and two of the Glenn legends. Glenn Davis uh, went the two following legendary. year, 46. Yeah, right. So Army was the national champs in 45, uh, 44, 45, and 46. Right. So you can see, you know, here they just survived the war. Right. And they fly down to New York to see this traditional football game, uh, the big game at Yankee Stadium. Yep. It was the big ones coming up in a couple of weeks. The Army-Navy game. Yeah, and on right. their way back home on uh, Sunday, November 11th, um, I, I question why they came up that way. It's not for me. I'm not an aviator. But when you come out of Caldwell, New Jersey, and you're going to Quonset Point, Rhode Island, right. you figure you just go along the coastline of Long Island and follow Connecticut right to where the base was. Right. They chose to go north on the Hudson River, get radio instructions from Stewart, and then go uh, eastwards towards Hartford for another air traffic control instructions to follow them into Rhode Island. And unfortunately, with the low cloud and the cloud level and the fog and the heavy rain, um, they had to stay low because I was told if they went over 3,000 feet in, in the month of November, they would have had to deal with ice conditions, right. which they're not ready to deal with at that time. And that's when they hit Mount but, it, but, but it's And I know you've uh, talked about the various ironies 
uh, of this whole incident and, and the people uh, surrounding it. Uh, I mean, the central irony, of course, is that you know here were these uh, heroic uh, soldiers, and and this is how they were killed, not in battle, where again Dixie Kiefer survived just unimaginable uh, injuries and pain and. You know, and 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 protected and saved all of his men, not just himself, right? Sure. And and then this is, this is how he unfortunately perishes, which, which is really a, the true definition of tragedy. You know that somebody of greatness all of a sudden falls or is taken down by the most unlikely or unexpected circumstances, and more. It's more that's Shakespearean tragedy in the yeah. in the true sense. Sure. But then the other irony is David. Uh, or you might say coincidences, and irony and coincidence are not really synonymous, they're two different things, but in any case, um, that Secretary of the Navy, Forrestal, came from Beacon, <laughs> just, uh, and then he went on to become, as we were discussing before, he went on to become the first Secretary of Defense, right. and I remember, his, I know his name from the aircraft carrier that uh, is historic because it was the first so-called supercarrier, the USS Forrestal. Um, the fact that it happened on what became Veterans Day, but was not Veterans Day in 1945. It was uh, Remembrance Day. Armist well, Armistice, Armistice Day, Day from World War One. Right, right. Then it became Veterans Day for, both, for both wars, or for yeah. all wars. Yeah. I mean, for, for all wars, actually. For anybody who fought, it became Veterans Day that we know now. Um, and then just, I mean, this is a very minor, you might say, coincidence, but, um, you know, that he... Uh, was on the USS Yorktown, and of course Yorktown is you know one but of was the, also the main part towns of the in this area. USS Yorktown, but they didn't call it that. When he was recovering from his injuries, they were making a documentary, a war documentary, to promote you know well, efforts, I guess, for the movie theaters at the time, and they called it the Fighting Lady. So he was the captain of the Fighting Lady. Oh, before it was called, before they dubbed it the USS Yorktown. It was the second USS Yorktown. Oh, I see. Because the first one sank, of course, that he was right. on. Right. But when he was recovering from the injuries, they put him in this movie and the fighting lady. And then um, when he recovered, it, then they made him the captain of the right. uh, Fort Ticonderoga, which they called the Big T. Right. That movie, the documentary, received the best um, documentary Academy Award. Oh, oh wow. Okay. So it was right. just like right. interesting things that just keep popping up. Like right. I, when I got involved in this, um, it's just another layer, another layer. I guess it's to say, like a peel an onion, just keeping open of another yep. one. Is, and it's just like, oh, no, and, and all you know. I mean, you deserve enormous credit for taking it upon yourself to, uh, you know, to spend all the time and research that you do, and and contacting people, and even contacting the media to let everybody know about it. Um, you know, in appropriately enough, you're doing it in service to their memory, right? To, oh, absolutely. That people need to remember that. And I also just want to. Well, first, let's say that people who want to know more about November 14th uh, and, and want to participate can go to your Facebook page, which is Friends of the Mount Beacon 6, right? They can right. look it up on it, Facebook. It, it's Friends of the Mount Beacon 6 plus 2. I'm going to change right. to Friends of the Mount Beacon 8, but if you go there right now, you'll right. see that. But I just quickly want to also mention, David, again, uh, in tribute to, to all our veterans and to Veterans Day on November 11th, that in the town of Cortland on October 30, it's Friday, October 30 at 2 p.m., on the front lawn of Cortland Town Hall, there's going to be uh, what actually is a rededication of the Veterans Memorial, uh, the monument that's there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a good friend of mine, Neil Gross, who is an officer in Chapter 21 of the Military Order of the Purple Heart, and Neil has been on the show before, and he will be on again. He, he would have been on today, but he's out of town. Um, but he, al along with the uh, senior vice commander of that chapter, uh, Eugene Lang, uh, sent me some information that I just want to share with everybody. And that is what I just mentioned, that they're going to have this uh, ceremony on Friday, October 30, 2 p.m. at Cortland Town Hall. And the supervisor of Cortland, as, as long as anybody can remember, because she does such a great job, Supervisor Linda Puglisi, uh, you know, she issued a proclamation that the town of Cortland is honored honored to not only be the first Purple Heart town in Westchester County, but also to have the first regional military order of the Purple Heart Memorial located in our community. It is a beautiful memorial and it reflects the dignity, valor, and patriotism of the Purple Heart veterans who have defended our great country throughout our history, which uh, is very well put. Um, and, and again, we salute all the veterans, not just on Veterans Day, but every day. 
Um, and, and with that, David, let's also talk about your recent experience with your your 90-year-old dad, God bless him, on the Honor Flight program. Oh, fantastic um, experience for all of us. I mean, the Honor Flight program is called Hudson Valley Honor Flight. They do four flights a year, two in the spring and two in the fall, one in you know, in the spring in Stewart and one in the spring in Westchester and again in the fall, which is what we did a couple of weeks ago from Stewart. There's one coming up in a couple of weeks at Westchester County on November 7th. I encourage all people to look into the Honor Flight program on their website, see if they can get involved in any way they can. And we should mention, so you're saying November 7th out of Westchester uh, County Airport. Airport in White Plains. Um, but people can also just go uh, and observe uh, the send-off, right, which is a, which yeah, that's is a, all a great it's, ceremony. It, huh? there's, it's just, which is, I mean, it takes too long to explain in this time yeah. show, but the whole point is it, it was so well done, and these guys were treated like royalty, like rock which, stars. Which, which they are. And, and, and they are. They're American and, royalty, and, by and, the way. And they're all humble, yeah. and, and, and it, they kind of were uncomfortable by all this in some ways, but... It was kind of cute, as they get all these young kids walking up to my father, shaking his hand, thanking him. They get the signs and the bands are playing, and my father's taking these baseball caps yeah. off. It was just, <laughs> it was, it was great because I got a chance to share um, some history with my father from when he was a young man, twenty years old, nineteen years old. When he was, know. and you said, and you said your father was. Uh, involved in a kamikaze attack, right? Yeah, he was a radio man for the ship called the LCS-88, and they were doing what they call picket duty around Okinawa, and he didn't know this until I read up on this, but um, the gunner that was on the uh, ship saw the plane coming in, and he was shooting at him, and blew his wing, wing off the plane, so he veered off to the side, and um, then exploded, but still, on the crew of 7120 were killed. Wow. And my father, the whole, almost all the officers were killed. My father oh. was in one deck below where the major impact happened, but he was on the radio, so he survived, and he's incredibly lucky. But um, and, and he's he's 90 years young, as we like to put it, right? Right. And you were saying that he was the youngest person on that honor flight, right? Yeah, his friend John, John's also right. 90. The both of them grew up in the South Bronx, a uh, street called Eagle Avenue, which right. no longer exists. Right. And... Um, they, they stay friends throughout their, all their lives. Uh, they happen to serve different parts of the Navy, but um, they got them both on the uh, flight. And John especially, he was like blown away because like I said, he got this beautiful letter from his daughter-in-law thanking him for being who he is, thanking him for bringing his son into the world because his son's an awesome father and a great husband. So thank you. That's and thank correct. you for coming to our house to make broccoli rob. <laughs> <laughs> and we're actually, so we're out of time, but I just want to also, uh, mention uh, and salute uh, in addition or as well as everybody who served uh, at any time in our country's history. My father, George, who was a uh, sergeant in World War II, and as I was saying to you, uh, it really is a testament to the, the uh, in, inimitable bond, uh, is, is one way to put it, the inimitable bond that being in battle with somebody creates. I mean, my, my dad, may rest in peace, till till his last day when he was like, uh, he was 84, it was about 1998, um, was closest friends with his army buddies who always called him Sarge, you know. And so we were saluting all the veterans on Veterans Day, November 11. And by the way, we also want to mention in the same spirit of patriotism uh, and democracy, make sure to vote on November 3rd. As, as many people say, and I am one of them, there is no greater privilege in this country than the right to vote. So please take advantage of the right to vote on November 3rd. And thank you, David Rocco. It's always a pleasure. Really. And thank you for all the great work you do. Uh, and thank you for watching Hudson Valley WXYZ with Bruce the Blog. And remember, when Bruce the Blog listens, people talk.